John News, we are independent, fearless, and credible. You're watching John News Prime with me, Samuel Kojo Bruce. In our headlines, this are Energy Minister continue to insist the current power crisis is not doom so, but doom CAC. As he says, it's only an NDC government that has witnessed doom so. And you don't last that they, they, they said that uh, doom so has finished. We've gone past the era where we had. 72 to 96 days of light out and six hours of light on. We are in the era of Doom CSA, which is, which is profoundly different from Doom so. Meanwhile, businesses are still reeling under the pain of Doom so, just days after a bold declaration by President Ekofuado that he has fixed it. And you don't last that they, they, they said that uh, Doom so has finished, but still, I see the Doom so. Doom so is still. Also, majority in parliament kick against publication of KPMG audit report into GRA SML deal. We have details of their stance on the deal, which they say has saved the country money. The majority also insists calls for the deal to be, to be terminated are unfounded. And it has emerged that a cluster of Chinese companies and some traditional authorities in the Wager and Ablekuma West areas are reportedly spearheading the illegal acquisition of lands within the protected Ramsar sites. He's a Chinese. He's pushing this thing. He must stop now. If I see him, I'll put police and soldier here. No truck would sound in here. Now the clock is ticking. Speaker of Parliament Alban Bagbing has seven days to recall Parliament for an emergency sitting after more than 100 majority MPs triggered provisions of the Constitution understanding orders. The majority leader, Alexander Feumarkin, says their decision is in good faith. He revealed that they had made several attempts to recall Parliament without the need to trigger an emergency sitting. The majority have also been wading into the current SML deal controversy. Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent Kwekwa Sante reports. The Majority Leader Alexander Fenyo Markin has been defending the decision by his caucus to request an emergency sitting of Parliament. He says there are so many outstanding government business that simply cannot wait. Whether or not the Majority Caucus is invoking its rights under the law in good faith, my answer is yes, we are. And the Speaker shall, shall, mandatory shall, within seven days after the receipt of the request, summon parliament. Now, this constitutional imperative has found space in our new rules book. According to the majority leader, if the speaker of parliament is out of town or is busy with any other schedules, his deputies are on hand to reconvene. But as far as they are concerned, the seven days is counting and he must reconvene the house. Our rule says within seven days, within seven days. It cannot be after. But the good news again is that fortunately now, um, per our new rules, order 12 and 52, Provide for the 12 provide for the deputies to sit in the absence of Mr. Speaker. The majority side have also been wading into the SMLGR deal. The presidency just a few days back presented their white paper on the KPMG audit report. The calls for the presidency to publish that report is facing some resistance from the majority leadership. We, the majority caucus, have also become aware of a call for a release of the KPMG uh, report in full. May I refer to the Right to Information Act, Act 989, and specifically rely on Section 5 of the said law, which said law is subtitled exempt information, information for the president or the vice president, and quotes, 
Information is exempt from disclosure where the information is prepared for submission or has been submitted to the president or vice president for consideration. According to Alexander Afenyo Markin, the NDC and CSOs must tone down on their campaign against SML as that could potentially destroy an indigenous Ghanaian business. The seven days is now counting and it will expire next week Friday and we expect the Speaker of Parliament as the Constitution mandates that he shall reconvene Parliament when 15% of MPs request an emergency sitting. We have not had any indication from the minority yet as to what they make of this except of the record conversation where they really say that this is much ado about nothing. But the next seven days, if Parliament reconvenes, the ministerial nominees is said to be taken for a vote and also a loan agreement as well as key questions about tax waivers. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. Now also Energy Minister Matthew Poku Prempe is doubling down on government's claim that there is currently no doom. So the country has been battling an intense power crisis that has resulted in severe outages for weeks. This week, President Ekofado announced that the crisis has been fixed, although analysts insist there is still load shedding. Answering questions before Parliament's Government Assurance Committee, Energy Minister Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe claimed the outages was uh, or where doom CAC and not doom so there is more in this follow in the following report the energy minister has taken his turn before the government assurances committee of parliament and has been providing answers in terms of the promises he made on the floor and his delivery the minister has been talking about rural electrification and how much he believes that this government has done the energy minister says the rural electrification program that government is undertaking does not know political colors what i said that the Ghana has reached 88.75. It will bring a cheer to everybody. I'm sure if we were doing electricity by who voted for who, we would not have been in 88.75. I'm sure if we're doing electricity by who voted for which president, NDC has been in power for longer, and your constituencies should have been fully electri electrified. We hope that we will restart this whole uh, electricity project as quickly as possible, because it affects every single region in the country. It's affected by our paucity or our difficulty or our suspension of ongoing electrical projects, even though we had even envisaged that by end of this year, we should reach the sustainable development goal for energy access for 2030. We should achieve it by the end of this year, and we are still working on it. Ultimately, Dumso also came back on the floor. The energy minister is categorical that this government has not witnessed Dumso and that it's only been Doom CAC and that it is the NDC government that rather witnessed Dumso. We've gone past the era where we had 72 to 96 days of light out and six hours of light on. We are in the era of Doom CAC, which is, which is profoundly different from Dumso. Dumso, as inflicted on Ghanaians, has only happened as characterized His Excellency John Dramani Mohammed's governance. He is the only president on record that for four years that he reigned, for four years that he ruled, for four years that he governed, there was doom, 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 doom. All the heads of state or presidents in the history of this country have suffered Dumso. Even President Kufo's era, they had to import toy generators from outside room under Kufiada, Honorable Kufiada. But President John Mahama was bold enough, humble enough, and took responsibility and said he was going to solve it. And he did solve it. Thank Before you very President much. President Mahama Rancy. left office, we have excess capacity. Th President let's... Mahama is the only president in the history of this country. Let's, who make, has solved it, let's make a headway. Thank you. Chairman of the committee, Farouk Ali Mahama, says they are impressed with the answers the minister has given and they're going to follow up with verification visits. We need to talk about the real challenges the minister tried to espouse, to say that uh, due to certain loan agreements that had stored the projects of certain projects, for his vis a vis the China loan and some of the SHEP projects. He was very, very frank. But there was other good side of it, which is the minister tried to expose. For instance, my constituent, people of UND, have got a lot of coverage. And he projecting the education project at 88.75, 
of the whole national grid. And that's a significant improvement by the minister, even though there's a room for improvement. No, we've not concluded that we are going to go a follow-up. We have two areas to cover how our commission, we're going to do a follow-up. The energy minister has given a door that we should come for him as to go for a tour. For instance, he's commissioned a, 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 this thing in Kumasi. We're going to go around all the projects the ministry have done. The Government Assurance Committee has now concluded its public hearings, at least for now. They will go back into conclave, prepare their report, and present it to Parliament when the House reconvene. And ultimately, the members also say they have to go through a verification visit to ensure that the, the claims that have been made before them by these ministers are all truthful. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. But barely two days after a public declaration by the president about how his administration has fixed the erratic power supply challenge, parts of the country are still reeling under the pain of doom. So parts of the national capital, including the central business district, have been without power for the greater part of Friday, forcing business owners to invest in fear to power generator sets to keep the operations afloat. Join us and gauge some business owners in part of Accra who expressed the pain they have had to endure pain induced by the erratic power supply. This is not a time for us to experience uh, this kind of uh, current situation. So the government has to do something radically about it. Don't forget, we, we have already paid. It's a big place of consumption, we have already paid. So for us to hold on to our money and still deny us light, in our opinion, I think it's not something fair. It's not, it's not post pain. This is a free pay something. So you are holding on to my money. You have denied me electricity like and you have not even told me anything. If you have made me aware that, for example, to be the things we are like, I will be happy to prepare towards that. But you will not tell me anything. For example, we have bought almost about a thousand dollars worth of uh, fuel. I have two shops here at La Paz. And we already want the data. So from money to this, this afternoon, we have had about thousand dollars to pay. So it's affecting us. It's, now it has reduced, but not all at all. Sometimes it comes and it goes off. It's not stable now. We are, we are hoping that it will be stable. That's what we are praying for. And you don't last that they, they, they said that uh, the are finished. But still, I see the Dunzo. Dunzo is still almost about four hours. Oh. Oh, there were three days today, we didn't see like a holy today. And then you said that they, they are finished, but still, Dunzo. So you lie to the people. You didn't get to the people. Uh, they said that uh, the Dunzo have been solved. But unfortunately, we have not seen anything like we have no, There's no improvement. And then we still have to use the generator for it, you understand? Yeah, that's the situation right now. We have it in Ghana. That's the problem. What time was the light taken today? It was around, if my memory tells me, it was around 10 a.m. that time. Uh, yeah, we are expecting it to come around 6 or 7 p.m. that way. We, we normally charge phones over here, so. When there's light out and then people don't normally come and charge their phones and the batteries that we are charging, people would come and take it in the evening. So obviously, if there's no light, we are going to lose on that way. But the doomsday has been fixed. Oh no, I don't think it's fine. I mean, it's not true. Because obviously, uh, I went to Accra even this afternoon and then there was even light out over there. Can't matter. I went there. A whole lot of places that we are experiencing it. We have not seen any improvement about it. We have not seen any improvement about it. Now it has emerged that a cluster of Chinese companies and some traditional authorities in the Wager and Ablekuma West areas are the leading individuals who are reportedly spearheading the illegal acquisition of lands within the protected Ramsar sites. The Greater Accra Regional Coordinating Council is now intensifying its effort to combat the encroachment on Ramsar site in order to prevent a potential flooding disaster and to save the unique ecosystem. My colleague Michael Ashley has more in this report. The regional minister designate in the company of other members of the Regional Coordinating Council visited the Tema Sakumono Ramsar site. It emerged that some individuals were behind the sale of these lands. The man, I was there, I was there at the church. The man, the man said, the man said he will get back to you. 
Has what he come back to you? So, but, but, no. No, what is Answer my question. Has he has he hasn't yeah. has met us. Trouble. Names have been mentioned, right? Throughout the conversation. You've heard names. Like who? He mentioned politically exposed people. There was one gentleman, the first gentleman, who categorically said all the houses in the area were sold by a gentleman called Lukman. Who is Lukman? Do I know Lukman? Yeah. Ask me. It is a very difficult question. How will I know who Lukman is? How will I know Mr. A or Mr. B? Titus Glover says they are beginning to unmask the individuals behind the sale of these lands. And let me send a warning to those in Tema. I'm told one Gideon, one or two, and Lukman are behind the sale of the Ramsa. Nobody has title to the land there. If I hear or see any of them enter the Ramsa, they will have a problem with me. The Coordinating Council is broadening its efforts to protect other Ramsar sites. At Makati Hill, the devastation was staggering. It was revealed that a group of foreign-owned companies were actively filling the Ramsar with laterite. We're here to witness for myself how they are pushing. I'm told he's a Chinese. He's pushing this thing. He must stop now. Now. So that we can save lives and property. Okay. If I see any truck with sun and stones to fill that place, I'll pick him. Hmm? Okay. If I see him, I'll put police and soldier here. No truck with sun bring here to feed the land and push. Mm -mm. What you have gone now is enough. Okay? okay. Yeah. The Ramsar site now spans approximately 1.9 million square miles, although it used to be larger. However, encroachments persist unabated. Encroachers have become increasingly audacious in their activities. This, this land is from the, it's, it's owned by the Forestry Commission. It's part of the Ramsar. So, so whatever you are doing, the feeling, stop it. Okay. The feeling that you are doing, stop it. Okay. If I see do you doing any feeling again, we we'll arrest you. No problem. So please stop the feeling. Authorities maintain that the Ramsar site is entirely owned by the government and anyone occupying it lacks proper documentation and is considered an illegal squatter. However, Ni Ofei Danso, who identified himself as the traditional ruler of the area, assessed that the land belongs to his family. While they previously operated under the cover of darkness, now some of their trucks carrying laterite can be observed even during daylight hours, transporting materials to fill the waterlogged area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a bittersweet moment for some individuals who had recently acquired parcels of land. So whatever you've paid, go and collect your money. I will make sure we we'll sanitize this place so that people's life can be protected. I'm pleading with you, Mr. Mills. So go and collect your money. So all these feeling, those who have contracted these trucks and dumping stones and sand to reclaim the waterlogged lands. This is a Ramsar. Nobody has title to this land. The Regional Coordinating Council fears that if the Ramsar site disappears, more areas will be prone to flooding. The water that once collected in the basin after heavy rain will now find its way into people's homes. The activities here is becoming like a parasite to the environment. The Regional Minister says, for now, it should be a stop work and stop filling the area. For Joy News, Michael Ashali. Now, construction works have begun on some inner city roads of the Volta Regional Capital Hall with funding from the World Bank, a project which falls under the Ghana Secondary City Support Program being implemented by the Ministry of Local Government and Road Development would see the selected roads receiving beauty and surfacing for the first time with some drainage works as well. There's more in this report. 
under the Ghana Secondary Cities Support Program, some roads in the Volta Regional Capital of Ho would see some faith lift. The roads that would be constructed with a grant from the World Bank are the Bob Kofi CK Road, Blissam Zion Junction, Chaco Markets Road, Ahuen Public Toilet Junction Heavy Road, and Barracks New Town Road, among others. Opeña Construction and Fed Sky Limited have been engaged to undertake the construction of the selected suburb routes. Gabriel Kweku Dega works with Bans Consult Limited, the supervising agency. And now on the surface dressing of the road, which also includes all those roads that I've mentioned. Z Blissam Zion Junction, Scrub Road, and the Market Shako Road. That's the work we are doing. As, as, as at this stage now, we are seeing, we are doing our primary seal for the various places that I've mentioned. So after the primary, what happened? After the primary, we are coming to do a seal. That is the first seal. And then there's, after that, we do the second seal. In the local language, we say sec first quota, second quota, third quota. So after that, then we do line marking of the road, design of the road, and then the signposts in the various areas of the road. Some storm drains in the capital would also be constructed to ease the devastation effect of perennial floods. The Home Municipal Chief Executive, Divine Borson said the road construction forms the core of an agenda to flood the municipality with development projects. Before we can fill the whole urban status, we should also be doing development so that in the future we will de-urbanize whole so that the urbanization will start affecting the periphery of whole. That is how we plan a city. So we must load whole with development. So that when the whole is overloaded with development, all other municipalities and districts in the region. And that is why we are doing this now. This fund is only meant for the main urban area. That's why the name goes secondary city. We must build city. Residents have lauded the initiative but entreated the contractors to ensure value for money and construct the roads to perfection. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, who? Now, residents of Block Factory at East Trasaco here in Accra say they are living in fear after two off duty policemen were shot and killed by unknown gunmen on Thursday evening. Now, we will be hearing from them shortly. But first, the Ghana Police Service says a manhunt is currently underway to arrest the perpetrators who fled on a motorbike. Maxwell Agbagba was in the community in our reports. A cloud of fear still hangs on the East Trasaco community a day after armed gunmen shot and killed the two off-duty policemen. On Friday morning, personnel of the Criminal Investigations Department were on the ground picking up crucial evidence and leads that could help arrest the perpetrators. The investigators were tight-lipped and we're not ready to provide any information. We are told by eyewitnesses um, that the two police men were seated um, on a bench right in front of their house, just like they usually do um, every evening when the shooting happened. We told that when one of them was shot, um, he tried fleeing back to the compound, um, but he fell down just here and fell unconscious. His blood splattered on the floor, and that is still visible, and he died right on the spot. The second police officer, who was also shot, the gunman who we are told came on motorbike, joined um, the motorway and fled um, the scene. Some eyewitnesses who we've been speaking to here have been narrating to us how the incident happened. A lady who's a co-tenant of the deceased policeman said she had gunfire in rapid succession. She came out only um, to see her co-tenants in a pool of blood outside. Hey, the gun shot there, like some action movie they were doing here. It was just, the gun was just running. They just opened fire. Then, more than, if I'm not exaggerating, more than 10 bullets. Or, like, it was just running. And the CID is married. He's living with the wife. 
But the other guy is single, so. so As you speak, when they go to the hospital, the lady has not returned from the hospital, so currently we don't know where she is. But I learned they took they took her to one uh, hotel for for them to cancel her because she couldn't she cannot take it. Mm -hmm. That's what we heard. Today, self, I was calling my landlord that I want my balance to leave here because I could have been a victim. That. I don't even know, I don't know anything about whatever that is happening. I, we don't know whatever they have, any problem they have with anybody. I could have been a victim if I was also sitting outside here. Another man who describes himself as a brother to one of the deceased policemen said he had not seen him since 29th April and had visited just so they could reminisce about the good old days. But unfortunately, this incident happened. No, 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 no. He says, I had closed from work around 6.32. The last time I saw him was 29th April. So I said I was going to hang out with him so we have conversations about life. I had just finished eating and washing the plates. Then I heard gunshots, so I became alarmed. I heard people crying. People started knocking on my door that my brother was dead. He died on the spot. The bullet hit him in the head and shoulder. One of the policemen died en route to the hospital, but my brother Ben died on the spot. He was a bodyguard of the Saboba MP. This is still the Joe News Prime. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more. Please do stay. Welcome back from the break. This is still the Joy News Prime. Now, the Ghana Police Service has assured the Council of State it will provide a highest level of security before, during, and after the December elections. The Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Ekufo Dampari, said the police will conduct itself professionally to ensure a peaceful and incident free election. The police's meeting with the Council of State is part of its effort of sensitizing key stakeholders on its security preparations to the polls. The police service has met with the Council of State to assure them of maximum security before, during, and after the elections that are going to happen in December. Now, the police made similar visits to the Electric Commission and the Civil Service last week. It is part of sensitizing the public on its full commitment towards protecting Ghanaians and the ballot boxes come December. 2024. Here is the IGP, Dr. George Akufutampari. The country will pass through this election and at the end of the day it will be judged as the most peaceful in the history of this country. And that is our commitment. We will work under the National Election Security Task Force encompassing all the security agencies because it's a national event and bringing everybody to the fore, and yet each one playing their role in accordance with the constitutional establishment, we will work together in what I call a partnership of teamwork in the interest of Madagascar. Chairman of the Council of State, Dasebre Otuo Srebwo, assured the Ghana Police Service of the Council of State's full support towards the protection of lives and ballot boxes come December 2024. They say they want a peaceful election 
in this country, as has always been the case since the Fourth Republic began in 1992. We are very much heartened to hear of the elaborate preparations that they have put in place to ensuring a very peaceful, fair, free, and transparent election. And we are even more heartened by the fact that uh, this is not an event that they are planning for, but it's a, a process which started about four years ago, or since the IG took over the reins of uh, administration of the police uh, service, and which uh, they have categorized into the pre, during, and after. And all the preparations that are being, are being made, or are being made, and we find them very much in order. Grace Ansa is the Assistant Commissioner of Police. And as some of us may be aware, when there the are general elections, the police works with all other sister security agencies under the National Election Security Task Force. So for our pre-preparations, we assured members that the Ghana Police Service is ready to deliver the general election in a safe, secure environment where there is peace, security, law and order. And our aim is to ensure that this election becomes one of the most peaceful ever. With barely seven months to the December polls, the police is assuring of maximum security come December 2024. But their meeting with the Council of State today will not be the last time they will be meeting various stakeholders. From the Accra International Conference Center, Kenneth Jesse for Joy News. Now, the Deputy Minister-designate for Information, Sylvester Tete, has pledged to ban the repeal of a provision in the Criminal and Offences Act 1960, Act 229. This provision labels journalists to have committed a misdemeanor if they publish or reproduce information likely to incite fear, panic, or disturb public peace, knowing or having reason to believe the information is false. He was speaking at the event in the residence of the German ambassador on the eve of World Press Freedom Day. As Ghana joins the rest of the world to mark World Press Freedom Day, questions about media freedom in the country continue to be asked. The country has dropped more than 30 places since 2018, from 23rd in that year to 62nd in 2023. One of the laws that can cause the arrest of a journalist is the Criminal and Offences Act. 1968 Act 2-9, which says a person who publishes or reproduces false information commits a misdemeanor. But the Deputy Information Minister-designate, Sylvester Tete, who defended the attacks on journalists that have taken place since President Akufuado took office, said he will support a bill to repeal the Criminal and Offences Act if presented before Parliament. If you look at all the infractions that have happened over the last five years, I doubt if all the infractions actions directly coming from political actors, they are non-political actors as well, that has contributed to these infractions we are talking about. That's why I keep making the point that the shared responsibility, education, advocacy, reforming our laws. Look, there are occasions that the ministry itself, or government itself, had to uh, issue statements condemning the police action on some of these matters. I have shared that position that personally, going forward. Today I'm in government, tomorrow I will not be in government. That is how life is. Tomorrow I'll end up perhaps practicing as a journalist. So if I help to ensure that the space, the ecosystem is free and fair, it benefits everybody. And it fetches democracy. So nobody is taking that, that is, is, is stuck that you can't do anything about it. So you must, you know. So you're in favor of repealing it? Should, I mean, as a matter of fact, it should. Executive Director of Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima, bemoaned the rate at which politicians are starting to own media companies which are used for political propaganda and called for a law to be implemented that will ensure that media owners have the capacity to pay their workers before they are given license to operate. A lot of them are set up by politicians, you know, an MP, uh, and, you, and you can name them, you, you know them. And so it's all about if my party is in power, I use my position to go for a frequency, set up a radio station in my village, to do the propaganda for me as the MP for the area. So I think the first thing is to have regulations that was that would that would set up certain parameters on who is qualified to have a radio station in terms of your management capacity, your resource capacity, 
um, the capacity to recruit, recruit at least a minimum number of professional journalists to be able to operate. Professor Audrey Gadjekbo is the Dean of the School of Information and Communication Studies at the University of Ghana. We know that uh, there's a lot of talk, a lot of concern about disinformation. We are about to go into elections and I worry and I know that our lives are going to be miserable because now we even have AI. And AI is allowing all kinds of things to happen. So there is concern, uh, a, a, a lot to be concerned about, and we ought to insist. Deputy Executive Secretary of the National Media Commission, Alexander Ni Kate Bannerman, said the commission is trying its best to protect the safety of journalists. If you talk about safety of journalists, I was at Class FM today, and I asked them, why didn't they report? We have seen it. And we've been there. Actually, it's with the police investigating. So I encourage them that last year we held a program with the Ministry of Information on the status of some of these infractions. So I encourage them that they should get us the chronology of events so that we can do a follow up with the police. The theme for this year's World Press Freedom Day is a press for the planet. Journalism in the face of the environmental crisis. Now, the Public Services Workers Union of the Environmental Protection Agency has petitioned the Office of the President over the allocation of the official residence of the Executive Director of the EPA to the Interior Minister. This followed the leadership declaration of an indefinite strike yesterday, said to commence on Friday, May 3, 2024. The strike was prompted by the union's objection to what they perceived as an attempt to evict the EPA's executive director, Dr. Kingsley Krugel, from his official residence for the new interior minister. Uh, we've decided to call off um, this uh, protest because um, just after yesterday, we had an engagement with our management and we were assured that they are going to sit with the Ministry of Works and Housing and also Interior Ministry, and um, you know, uh, resolve the issue. Uh, we trust our management and, and the board. So we would like to call off the protest and uh, hand over everything to our management uh, to resolve. But then the leadership of PSWU, uh, EPA, is going to petition uh, the Jubilee House, will petition the ministry, who petition the board of EPA and the executive director of EPA. Uh, we, we are hopeful that we'll get a positive response after petitioning these uh, institutions. Uh, in case we don't receive what we are expecting, then uh, we'll call on you and uh, inform you on our next line of action. Monday is the Ministry of Works and Housing should um, consider Environmental Protection Agency in any decision of uh, the ministry giving the residents out. Uh, EPA has occupied the residents for 50 years now. And we should be the first institution to be considered even if they want to let the bungalow out to any other institution. Again, we want uh, the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, which is our mother ministry, to intervene and help resolve this issue on our behalf. And um, we, we know the ministry have come in, 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 in and help us in several situations in the past. And this is not something that they cannot do. Uh, we are sure they can do it, they can resolve it. That's why we are going to petition them. Meanwhile, the General Secretary of the Public Services Workers Union of TUC informed Joy News that he's been in talks with the Wax and House and Minister expressing optimism for a forthcoming agreement. I believe our members at the EPA uh, brought it to our attention uh, of the developments in relation to the residence of the uh, uh, executive director. And that has been the residence of uh, previous executive directors of the EPA since uh, 1974, uh, per their records. Um, Subsequent executive directors have occupied there uh, without any um, problems or challenges. Um, and they have gone ahead 
over the years to carry out uh, some renovation works, including expansion and all that. Uh, so it's just become um, uh, something like an official residence for the head of that institution. Uh, every institution uh, have residences for um, the chief executives or MDs or e executive directors, as they may be called. Uh, so they have occupied this place for a very long time. So uh, anytime there's an executive director, they assume. But I believe uh, the message that got to me uh, as at yesterday was that um, it, l it looks like the, there's some directive uh, for the executive director to vacate uh, the premises uh, for another minister um, to assume uh, that resident. Of course, this raised uh, some concerns among the uh, staff, uh, and therefore uh, they had had a meeting and that decision uh, was taken. Uh, I've engaged the Minister of Works and uh, Housing, and I thank him for the courtesies. Um, he's given me a, um, a perspective on what is really happening. I've engaged uh, my people at EPA as well. Um, well, uh, as at now, I wouldn't want to go into that on air. I mean, when you are working with partners, uh, you must uh, respect each other's view. But uh, my engagement with him has brought some perspectives on the issue. And of course, uh, that is why I think in discussion with um, the union at EPA, uh, the best thing would be to hold on. Let's see. Um, if we can find a, a better uh, way of resolving this, um, then if we have understanding. No, nobody wants any uh, disturbance. We are already struggling under very difficult working conditions uh, and challenges in the economy, which is affecting uh, workers. Workers are struggling to have resources and equipment to work with, not to talk about the uh, difficult, bad working conditions they work in. No worker is really interested in, 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 in going out to cause any disturbance. But sometimes um, the frustrations also get people uh, to react. But All right, so welcome back. Let's do showbiz now. And um, Becky Bex is already in the house with all the gist that you need. Hi, Becky, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> are you doing? <laughs> I wish people would, would, you know, come behind the scenes and hear exactly what we've been discussing behind the scenes. But, I mean, yeah. that's not what we're discussing exactly. today. Let's mm -hmm. talk about celebrated Ghanaian musician Stoneboy through his charity organization, the Livingston Foundation. Surprise, a talented autistic boy with gifts in observance of World Autism Month. Holyfield Odoba, who has remarkable abilities in singing, performing, and drawing, caught the attention of Stoneboy and his foundation through viral videos showcasing his performances of Stoneboy songs. Away from Stoneboy, Ghanaian rapper Strongman has stated that he has never initiated any beefs with anybody in the music industry. This comes at the back of claims that the musician only thrives on beefs with other celebrities. I don't trend on beefs because I'm not the one who always, you know, I, I don't throw first shot. You get me? Oh. So I only do replies. I don't, I don't do oh. beefs. Oh, yeah. but why do you reply though? You can just keep quiet and move. No, sometimes you you know if symptoms persist for more than three days, you consult you, your doctor. Yeah, you consult your doctor. <laughs> so you yeah. you are you are the doctor. I'm the doctor, and we have insurance principle which which is indemnity. It talks about you restoring the person mm -hmm. back to his or her former position. So if someone insures a Range Rover and it catches fire, the insurance company is supposed to compensate the person with a Range Rover, not okay. with an Elantra. Okay. So if you come and fool, I need to you know let you know that yo, you need to stop what you're doing. Right. So that's what I do, is just replies. I don't really do beef, so I don't start the beef. So when any beef that you've seen me, you know, being involved in, I, I, I didn't start it. Oh, really? Yeah, so the people, they started and I helped them to finish. <laughs> Strong one right there. He got you. <laughs> I know, right? I know, right? It's very deep. Yeah, you right started. There. I'll help you finish it. Yeah, he's always been finishing it up.
Uh, Brace, let me tell you about Adun mm -hmm. TV since Truma season six because mm -hmm. it comes to an end with its highly anticipated grand finale set to take place on Sunday at the West Hills Mall on uh, the Accra Kaswa Highway. The event promises to be a star-studded affair featuring an incredible lineup of Ghana's top entertainers who will take the stage to deliver unforgettable performances. Akese Brimpong, M.O.G. Afronita are set to deliver a performance that will leave a lasting impression on everyone in attendance. Now, let me take you to London yeah. because this right. is We're London. Indigo, yeah? London mm. Indigo, O2 Indigo ah. is alive. It's actually yeah. currently happening. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in London, mm. you should pass by the Indigo, O2 Indigo, uh, where Medicals Live concert is happening. Sarkodie, Ifia, Shatawale, others are currently treating patrons. Well, I'm not too sure. Sakure hasn't been on stage yet, mm -hmm. but it's actually live on Medical's uh, YouTube page yeah. for those of you uh, who want to catch it live. It's Medical Live in concert. Well, Please I'm, don't, I'm, I'm don't, told don't uh, miss it. a lot of people have really... Um, it's been oversubscribed. That's what I saw. Yeah, it's, it's, it's told, actually sold yeah, out yeah, concert. Yeah, sold out. So, and I think that he's done really well for yeah. himself. He's said to... Uh, do this and project Ghana. He actually mm. tweeted that he wanted to project Ghana. Yeah. This is for Ghana. So. And I'm very, you know, excited that Congrats to him. promoting yeah. Yeah. You know, Ghana. Yeah. Uh, to it's the a joy to well. see people flourish. Yeah, yeah. We, we, but, we can't wait to uh, watch all the performances. So I'll bring them all to you, the highlights, yeah. Yeah. on Monday. But brush your teeth with Pep Sodans, baby boy. Yeah, I'm going to do that. It's very important. Every oh. night and day, huh? Yeah, you okay. can use, uh, what's it called, the Pep Sodans charcoal. You can... Uh, the cavity fighter, you can use Pepsodent Herbal or Pepsodent Triple Protection because with Pepsodent, like every I always smile. say, every smile matters. Uh, my smile, I have you the look, biggest you smile. Look, you look beautiful as well. Thank you. Well, uh, it's, see uh, me. Like, yeah. See me. See, oh, yeah, it's time. It's uh, time to do shout uh, outs. Well, shout outs anyway. to my coffee. <laughs> shout outs to everybody. <laughs> we don't do shout outs on the news, okay. but we're doing uh, it. Oh, well, anyway. You want to do you. shout outs to somebody? Oh, no, no, no. Then Mom. let's log on to my journal.com, people. I'm in the spirit. Hey. Anyway, Bale Lili Elio is the Hadebule Airway in Tiamre. What is going on? Uh, Brace. You want to start that, speaking Aigwe, will you? No, 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 no. I had to greet my people in a language. Okay, the let me language. Meet that Penamia Katabe, me, Pomi, Fianya, Joy New Seya. Oh, uh, Emma Davis. Please take it away, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right.